You are about to enter the Ghostly Archives. Welcome everyone. We are about to go live on the Ghostly Archives podcast. I have an amazing guest for you tonight as usual. But while we're waiting for everyone to stream in, you can help the podcast grow by doing a few clicks and giving a little bit of your time. So remember, while you're waiting for the live stream to start, go over and subscribe to your favorite platform. Give the content a like, thumbs up, and make sure to share that content on your social media or share it from the platform you're viewing it on. And also go to the audio podcast platform of your choice and give us five stars, especially on iTunes. That helps the show show up in the ratings and it helps people become aware of us. So hang tight, got about another minute and we'll be right with you with tonight's special guest. All right, everybody, welcome to the Ghostly Archive show. So you guys know the drill. Before I get into introducing my guests and having a little chat, you can support the show by subscribing on your favorite platform, thumbs up, liking this show, sharing the link, sharing the content on your own platforms, and recommending our wonderful guest today, Dean Bertram. And you can also go to the audio form of the show, podcast form and give us five stars. That five stars helps this show show up in the charts, which makes people see me. Yay. That's exciting. I don't know if you've noticed or you've been here before, but I got a new theme song and it was written a couple of years ago. I had a show that didn't go through because I was so busy working and I found the music again. And I thought, you know what, this will be perfect to use on this show. It was sampled after, I don't know if you guys know the movie Suspiria from 1977, but we did a sample of the theme song and we kind of modeled it after that. So I wanted to use it again. I just want to give thanks to the composer, Matthew Lee Ambleton. I've got his website up there if you guys want to check him out. MatthewLeeAmbleton.co.uk. He's a composer out of the United Kingdom. Check him out. Thank you. All right. So Our guest tonight is Dr. Dean Bertram, and we, of course, are talking about the Shaver Mysteries, which I'm learning right along with you tonight. But Dean has a PhD in history from the University of Sydney, Australia. His doctoral dissertation was titled Flying Saucer Culture, a Historical Survey of American UFO Belief. His writings have been featured in a range of publications from 14 times, People Magazine, The Spectator, and The Australian. And he hosts his own podcast called Talking Weird on the Untold Radio Network. So check that one out. 
Dean is also a filmmaker. He also is a film festival programmer. He runs the Midwest Weird Fest, which one day I'll have to check out. That's in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And he's currently shooting a feature documentary about Raymond A. Palmer, The Shaver Mystery and the Birth of Modern UFO Belief. And that documentary is titled The Man Who Invented Flying Saucers. Whoo, I got it all. So I'm going to bring, let's bring Dean in and um, have a chat with Dean about the Shaver Mysteries. Welcome, Dean. It's so great to be here with you, Melissa. And your theme song is great. As soon as I heard it, I'm like, that's like an Italian giallo theme. It's like something the goblin did. And so I'm like, yeah, okay, I was right. Great, so book. great thing. We um we had I had a f- podcast called Folklore Dark and I had started it and I was working so much, it was brutal. I was working with palliative care and dementia pl- patients like seven days a week, like Gosh. fifteen hours. It was insane, and I c- just couldn't get to it. And I spent money. I'd hire someone to compose that, and we totally sampled it off of that. And I thought I found it, and I'm like, you know, I, that cannot go to waste. I have to use that song. So here we are. Great choice. All right, so. I don't know a lot about the Shaver Mysteries, so maybe we can start off with who he was and what it is. Sure. I guess to understand the Shaver Mystery, you kind of have to understand the two people who co-created it, really. We'll start with Raymond A. Palmer. Raymond A. Palmer was born in Milwaukee in, I think, 1907. Maybe it was a little bit later. Let me try to remember when it was. It was 1910. I had it wrong. Shaver was born in 1907. And he was an extraordinary child. He claimed later in life that he could remember things from being a baby, like he could remember his crib, he could remember what people did and interacted with him. And the most interesting claim of all was he had this very vivid memory of his grandmother holding him up to the kitchen window and showing him Halley's Comet as it flew through the sky. Now, later, what is interesting is supposedly Palmer was still in the womb when Halley's Comet went out of visible sight. And he recognized this, like in his autobiography, um, he said, yeah, no, I know I wasn't meant to be able to see it, but I have this very solid memory. So I must have seen it. So he was able to kind of, I suppose, reconcile the 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 imaginary with the real and that started to frame the person Ray Palmer was and certainly I think you need to understand that story to remember who he became now while he had a very kind of golden childhood initially he was even featured as like you know the healthy baby of Milwaukee in some some milk ad campaign like his golden child was this beautiful little you know flaxen curly haired you know perfect baby but he had a terrible accident when he was seven years old and this kind of I suppose, explains the rest of Ray Palmer's development. And people say it was a beer truck or it was a a milk truck or an ice truck. There are various versions of what happened, but he was playing in the street and he got his leg truck stuck in the spokes of an old truck when they still had spokes. And the truck driver took off and heard these terrible screams of this child who was being rotated with the truck wheel and slammed into the asphalt again and again and again. And he stopped and he carried Raymond Palmer home. I think he asked some other neighborhood kids, where does this boy live? They were nearby and he took him to his parents' home and his father was there. And the driver said, I'm so sorry, let me drive you all to the hospital right now. This boy needs immediate medical care. And the father who was poor and was also a drunkard said, "Um, ah, he'll be fine. Just lay him out on the sofa. And that was Mm -hmm. the beginning of Raymond Palmer's kind of physical descent into being somewhat of a cripple so he got worse and worse and worse and eventually they did hospitalize him and throughout the rest of his youth he had multiple surgeries he had multiple illnesses he never fully recovered um he when he was older he had i I suppose what you would say was a hunchback and various stories say he grew not much more than four feet some say five feet certainly i would probably say somewhere in that range is accurate he was a very short man Mm-hmm. When he was laid up and so sick, what happened is he he just read and he read and he read and he read and he read. Every, there's stories that he read every book in the Milwaukee Public Library because all he could do was lie on his back, I suppose, or his front or however they positioned him. And when he got around and started moving, he find, he eventually on a newsstand in his teens saw the very first issue of Amazing Stories. Now, Amazing Stories is the pulp magazine 
which introduced the term science fiction. It was originally, then it was called science fiction, and then it became short and more to science fiction. And he fell in love with science fiction. And he wrote art, he wrote stories himself, which were published in various magazines. He founded what was probably the very first fanzine ever, a magazine called The Comet. And as it happened, eventually Amazing Stories, the magazine that turned him on to science fiction, was acquired by the publishing company Ziff Davis. And it, had, it was essentially bankrupt. The magazine was like just failing. And so they took a chance and hired Ray Palmer. Someone recommended there's this kid who, you know, writes a lot of science fiction. He heads his fanzine. And in 1939, Ray Palmer was hired and he turned this failing magazine, which I think was probably selling less than circulation was left in less than 50,000. He rose that to 135,000 and he rose it even higher because in, I believe it was the early winter of 1943 when amazing stories received a letter and the letter was from from richard shaver and richard shaver said i've discovered this ancient pre-diluvial language called mantong which every other language on the planet has originated from and palmer himself didn't read the letter initially he's kind of his underling one of his his associate editors, a man called Harold Brown was reading the letter and he was kind of joking and, you know, saying, ha ha, listen to this nutbag. And then he scrunched up the letter and he threw it in the trash can. And Ray Palmer walked over to the trash can and he fished it out and he said, run the whole letter in the next issue. And Brown said, well, I'm just kind of learning the trade. Why do you want to run this, you know, crazy piece of trash? I want to know. And he said, you'll see. And Palmer had a nose for a great story. And that Man -tong, that Mantong story, that letter became a sensation with fans trying to um, trying to actually, you know, dissect the language and see if it worked and Palmer running more and more on it. And Palmer knew he was onto a good thing. And he received another manuscript from Richard Shaper called A Warning to Future Man, which was essentially just this 10,000 word screed about an ancient civilization that had fled underground prior to, you know, pre-Atlantean times because the sun was irradiating everybody. And eventually the giants of that era, the Titans who had grown so big because they lived so long, fled the planet and left behind these people called the Abandoned Darrow. And there were good abandoned Darrow, the Darrow. And Darrow was kind of short for de for detrimental robot. And robot didn't mean they were robots. Like oh. robots. It meant they were they were guided by evil thought processes and the poisoning of the radiation from the sun and from the machines that they operated, this ancient technology left underground by this ancient powerful race, had poisoned them so much that they became physically stunted and psychologically stunted and they kidnapped people from the surface to eat them and to rape them and to do terrible things with them. And the other people which were outnumbered by the Darrow were the Terror. They were still good humans, sometimes with some problems, but their morality was still okay. Anyway, so so Palmer took this a, few, a, a warning to future man and he took the 10,000 word document and he changed it into a kind of Buck Rogers type science fiction story called I Remember Lemuria, which he, he ran as the cover story and he built it up beforehand. So between the letter and I Remember Lemuria, he, he kind of... So I think the letter was published in January 1944 issue, and I don't think the Lemuria story was published for a number of months after that. And in, in the meantime, he kind of built up, we've got this big secret coming, and it's not going to be a normal story. It's based on, it's based on something real. And they launched this story and said it was based on racial memory. Now, Richard Shaver didn't say it was racial memory. Richard Shaver had said he'd been into the caverns. He'd experienced these people. He'd accessed their thought records. He knew the history. Right. But when, when Palmer went to run it by Ziff Davis, the publishers, Mr. Davis, he said, I'm just going to run it as this like racial memory thing. And Davis gave him the go ahead. And then at first they ran it just as this racial memory. And then the next issue, Shaver came out and said, no, it's not racial memory. I've been in the caverns. I've accessed the thought records. So then what was this science fiction magazine, which was the leading science fiction magazine in America by this time, Palmer had, had risen it from the grave. So it was publishing about 135. When the Shaver mystery kicked, it went to 185. And according to Palmer and to some other people, it went as high as a quarter of a million circulation, which was enormous in those days. So basically the Shaver mystery was supposedly Richard Shaver's own experience with these underground races and this incredible technology 
which the people underground still used to interfere with the surface. So not only did they kidnap people from the surface to eat them or to torture them, they also used these rays to spy on the people of the surface, to on the mm-hmm. surface, to, to transform messages into their heads, to torture the people, to cause every accident you can imagine from tripping down stairs to plane crashes to automobile crashes to to everything from the smallest little thing to these massive cataclysms that Darrow were doing below the surface. So that was the meat of the Shaver mystery. So L- the Lemuria stuff, was this the first time that we've ever heard of it? Because I've heard of Lemurians from psychics and New Age stuff, heard it over. Was this the first mention of that ever was in this instance or what, does it predate this? That's an excellent question. Lemuria, as you mentioned, was very popular already in New Age at what what was probably theosophical. It might even be called New Age circles then and occult circles. And it was based on the idea that there must have been some kind of continent between, I think, India and Africa because there were Lemuria. There were, there, there were lemurs, like those little monkey creatures in different places. Yeah, and so yeah. some, some zoologists had proposed, well, there must have been a land bridge and a continent that sunk. So it was just kind of, it was a scientific theory, but for the new age or for the theosophists and for cultists, it was like another Atlantis story. So there right. was this ancient civilization with all this wisdom in it. So it, that had become, you absolutely correct, popular in new age circles beforehand. And Ray Palmer had run earlier Lemuria stories and he noticed whenever he put Lemuria on the cover, the magazine sold better. So Shaver had never mentioned Lemuria. Shaver had mentioned Atlantis. But Palmer knew uh, Lemuria sold well. So Palmer, so that's why it's such a great question because it changes the shape of the story and it goes to show so how. So he's coming at Palmer it from was. a marketing point of view, yeah. like, okay, he's saying this, but people people like Lemuria. So let's go. Absolutely. And I don't think, I think sometimes people look at those aspects of Palmer's kind of Barnum esque nature and his ability to sell a story. And he certainly recognized a good story. But I believe that Palmer genuinely thought there was something to shave his stories mm-hmm. it, it of course he still wanted to make money and sell magazines but he why the shave a mystery initially and that mantong letter initially i think sparked his interest so much and certainly um natus in his biography on palmer the man um the man from mars and i think richard toronto in his excellent book war of lemuria also talks about this is that while Palmer Palmer certainly was conscious that this stuff would kind of sell, he was also wanting to blend his interest and his importance as a science fiction writer with his other interests, which were kind of mystical and out there. He thought science fiction kind of was doing something to the way we were we were as a species open to exploring the unknown he he said that for example the war of the worlds broadcast in 1938 so this predates the shaver mystery sometime in fact this is around Mm -hmm. the time he becomes editor of amazing stories he was he said that people are so conscious to now or so capable of believing in these other things extraterrestrials and invasion because science fiction has made their minds expand and i think palmer wanted to keep expanding people's minds to get at these kind of mystical secrets well, it's interesting because that um, notion there's, of this ancient civilization, you're hearing this today with people like Graham Hancock, who are mm-hmm. actually exploring, they're finding different things, and they're finding that the narrative is either too simple or just possibly blatantly wrong. So, I mean, it's interesting that you see these people looking at this and talking about science fiction and it having an effect because surely it does because some of the stuff you see in the past in science fiction is actually science reality now exactly. and you see exactly. people investigating this like graham hancock saying hey there's something to the sphinxes there's something here so there, the, these world disasters aren't just fairy tales yeah and i i think that while there were people who posited the collapse of ancient civilization type stories prior to Shaver. Um, Donnelly's book on Atlantis, The Predilluvial World, which was so popular in the late 19th century, talked a lot about this. Various occultists and other people had talked about this. The Shaver mystery 
was at the cusp of UFO belief, and it introduced so many of, the, of these ideas of ancient spacefaring civilizations that people like John Keel, the author of the Mothman Prophecies, I think rightly said Palmer was the man who invented flying saucers. He popularized all of these ideas in the Shaver mystery before 1947, before Kenneth mm -hmm. Arnold first had his sighting of nine strange craft near Mount Rainier in Washington State. Do you think that could have influenced Palmer? Possibly? Well, to interpret it that way? Not that I'm saying he was wrong or didn't see anything, but oh, you mean, perhaps it could, influence it, could it influence uh, Yeah, because you're saying this stuff predates him, and then he has mm -hmm. this UFO stuff. Um, how do we know he's not influenced by this? Well, John Keel would say that he was. John Keel mentioned and it's so true i've got a pile of amazing stories obviously back in my office there are covers particularly back covers which often were like the ripley's believe it or not cartoons of olden days but like it would have a picture of like ancient civilizations fleeing in spaceships or it would have you know a, a pyramid in mesoamerica with a spaceship landed next to it and one cover during palmer's run and before before Kenneth Arnold's sighting, has genuine flying saucers on the back of the cover before people were talking about disc-shaped craft regularly. So Palmer had introduced this, ironically, the same month that Kenneth Arnold had that sighting in, in June of 1947, the June 1947 issue of Amazing Stories. And don't forget the dates normally when you take it off the newsstand. So it was already on the newsstand when Kenneth mm -hmm. Arnold had his sighting in 1947. The Amazing Stories issue of 1947 was the Shaver, the Shaver Mystery Special. Now Shaver had already been dominating that magazine for the last two years. But this issue of Amazing Stories was dedicated to nothing but the Shaver mystery and related stories. And there was an issue in that, there was rather an article on that issue called Visitors from the Void, written by a prominent Fordian at the time, Vincent Gaddis, who wrote about historical flying saucer sightings before the term flying saucers was being used to describe extraterrestrial spacecraft so it's already on the newsstands so I, one of america's most popular pulp magazines certainly the most popular science fiction magazine there's an article in the amazing stories talking about visitors from the void written not by a science fictiony guy but by a fortian describing this and going through multiple cases so palmer had laid all of this out before arnold had his sighting but perhaps even more important is is the relationship with Palmer and Arnold after Arnold's sighting. Palmer sees this, Shaver sees this, Shaver goes, see, I told you the flying saucers do come out of the, the caves. Mm -hmm. Palmer hires Arnold to write his story for the very first issue of Fate magazine which he was about to release. He he knew his time at Amazing Stories was coming to an end for a couple of reasons. The editors, no, the, he was the editor, the owners, Ziff and Davis, no longer wanted him running Shaver mystery stuff. They even put the kibosh on him running a special UFO issue. They didn't want any more of this, um, this non-science fiction-y, but supposedly 40 and real stuff. Fans had complained. There'd been red light, red, red letter writing campaigns. Um, major magazines had mocked it. So the Ziff, da and Ziff and Davis, the owners, kind of were sick of it. They said no more of this. So Palmer wasn't happy about that, but he also wasn't happy because he loved the Midwest. He was from Milwaukee. He now lived in Chicago, and they were moving to New York. So him and Curtis Fuller, Curtis Fuller was the editor of their flying magazine, their magazine just about, you know, aircraft and the like. They both planned this kind of, you know, this kind of escape hatch and they launched a magazine called fate magazine and the very first issue of fate magazine which is still around today the world's longest running mm -hmm. publication in this space palmer and curtis fuller launched this and the cover story was kenneth arnold's story and so he hired arnold to write this story and then he also hired arnold to go to maury island even before that story was out he'd hired arnold in the very early days to go to maury island where the very first ufo type crash had supposedly happened so he hired the America, the world's first and most famous flying saucer witness, to go and investigate the Maury Island affair. He wrote pieces for Fate magazine based on that. And he and Ray Palmer co-authored the book called The Coming of the Sources. And so much of modern UFO lore, everything from Men in Black, Missing Time, Flying Saucer Crashes, Cover-Ups, the death of two Air Force officers who crashed flying back from Maury Island to base carrying remnants of supposedly of this crash, 
everything we think about in modern ufology almost is in that book, The Coming of the Source. Right. And that's Ray Palmer and Kenneth Arnold writing it together. So it's I got a question sure. from the audience. Uh, Emily would like to know if Palmer ever connected with Edgar Casey that you're aware of. You know, I'm not sure if he ever connected with him. I do believe he talks about Casey, though certainly in Fate magazine there were Casey articles. I'm sure I'm sure he also talked about him in some of his other magazines like like um Search and Mystic and um and um Ray, even Ray Palmer's forum. But I I'm not sure. It's a great question. I'm gonna I'm actually gonna go and check that out. I'm not sure if he ever had an actual mm -hmm. connection with um with Casey. I'm not even sure what year Casey ultimately died. I'm not sure mm, when he passed. I'm Maybe not sure Emily, either. You have Emily to reference that. Emily, if you know, let us know. Yeah. Um, one more question and then we can go on to some other things. Um, no, not that one. Do we know who among the early UFO researchers actually read the Palmer Shaver stories? That's from Horace Smith, who's the Emeritus Professor yeah. of Astronomy and Physics at Michigan State University. Thank you. Wonderful. For Thank you, Horace. I think almost everybody, to be honest. I think people who were interested in this kind of stuff read Amazing because Amazing was talking about fate type weirdness before fate was published. So I think Palmer understood how attractive it was to people who were interested in the weird like him. So he often had stories. The Shaver mystery is a classic example to run this as racial memory and then to run it as thought records and to hedge the Shaver mystery as real. It applied to people. It appealed to people within that space. And certainly UFO authors like John Keel could remember reading it when they were, were they, when they were, you know, much younger. Yeah. So I think it probably yeah. it had penetrated s significantly. Again, it was America's most popular science fiction pulp. It was one of America's most famous pulps. It had this incredible circulation at the height of the Shaver mystery. So even if you didn't necessarily regularly read it, you might have picked up your kids or your friends or your neighbors or seen it on the newsstand. I think when magazines today sell advertising, they don't sell, mm -hmm, they don't, mm -hmm. they try to, because I've advertised in magazines and they try to, they try to push how many people like, okay, we have a circulation of 200,000, but we know it's read by a million people and they're probably exaggerating, but it's the same kind of thing. You might've sold for every, uh, for every one issue sold, maybe three or four people might have had contact with that issue, either seeing it on the newsstand or or reading it. So as Keel suggested, millions of Americans were exposed to the right. concept of flying saucers, the concept of uh, of space bound, you know, well, pre diluvian civilization. If you're reaching 150,000 or more, there's no way that people can't be affected by it that are into that. Yeah. Um, do you know anything about Fred Chrisman? Oh, well, Question thank from you for... Incognito. Uh, yes, Fred Chrisman. Uh, I have a very good friend, Brian Shickley, who I met him when I, I screened one of his films, which he submitted to Midwest Weird Fest, called The Fred Chrisman Chronicles. It's this hilarious cartoon which weaves Chrisman into the Shaver mystery because he was in he was very much involved with it. And Chrisman's a fascinating human being. Fred Chrisman wrote an ish, wrote a letter to Amazing Stories. This is his first contact with Ray Palmer during the Shaver mystery. And he said that he would fought the Darrow in the caves during World War II. I think his, his plane had gone down on some island and he'd gone into the caves and him and his buddy had actually literally like, you know, had a battle with the Darrow. And I think maybe his friend was killed and he got some, you know, laser beam shot through his arm or something. And later he wrote another letter about it. And here's the fascinating thing about Fred Christman. So Fred Christman's involved in the Shaver mystery in a relatively minor capacity, but he's writing letters and, and Ray Palmer's engaging with him in these letters. The Maury Island incident, which I mentioned before, which is kind of the proto Roswell, according to uh, Fred Christman and his buddy Roland Dahl, uh, it can't be wrong, Dahl. That's that guy who did Willy Wonka. Some, what's Dahl's first name? I forget. Dahl, anyway, so Chrisman and Dahl supposedly had seen, originally Dahl saw these nine disc-shaped, in fact, donut-shaped crafts. They were they had holes in the middle of them. When he was operating a bo uh, his boat on Pugent Sound, um, he saw these nine crafts. Was it six? I think it was six, actually. Six craft, and one of the, do the donut-shaped crafts was in trouble. It was shaking. It was spewing out metal. It looked like it was going to crash. And the other donut-shaped crafts were flying around it. The metal spewed down onto the boat, killed Dahl's dog. Harold Dahl is who it was. Killed Dahl's dog, injured his son's arm, and they fled the shore to try to escape it. And his his 
the original narrative said Chrisman was his boss, but I think Chrisman was really just his associate. He told Fred Chrisman about this crash, and then Chrisman supposedly went back, saw these craft hover, or one of the craft hovering around the crash site or the expulsion of the debris site, and rounded up a bunch of the debris. So Fred mm -hmm. Chrisman is the person who notifies Ray Palmer about what happens at Moray Island. Fred Chrisman is the reason that. Palmer hires Kenneth Arnold to go and check it out. Fred Chrisman is the guy who shows who shows Kenneth Arnold around and gives Kenneth Arnold uh, or gives the two Air Force officers who Kenneth Arnold calls the debris from the Maury Island incident. And then they fly away with this debris and their plane catches fire midair and they both die. And bye-bye debris. No, the, I mean, so the, the the plane essentially loses, I think, an engine ignites in air. I think two other people bail out. And the two the two Air Force officers who were investigating, Army Air Force, it was the very beginning of the Air Force. Because That's it used to be, and they awfully don't. suspicious. It's it's very strange. And then so uh, Palmer's, he, here's another reason why, why I think it's justified in some ways to talk about Ray Palmer and Richard Shaver being, um, being, the people who created flying sources, particularly Ray Palmer, is that they're investigated after that. Because don't forget, Palmer's paid Kenneth Arnold to go and do this investigation and the Air Force get involved. Mm -hmm. and it's this big deal. And there's an FBI memo from back in the day saying that literally saying who went and investigated Shaver and Palmer saying maybe Palmer and Shaver are just doing all of this stuff for some beat up. And essentially that they're the people who've created this whole flying saucer mystery. So it's fascinating to see. So to, to answer the the reader's question or the listener's question, yes, Fred Christmas is a massive part of this. And Christmas goes on to be involved with the JFK assassination. And it's crazy. Like Christmas' role in, in esoteric, bizarre history. Like Garrison subpoenas uh, We could Christman. go down a wormhole with yeah. that. I mean, I think Garrison, that's a different show. <laughs> yeah, Garrison subpoenas Christmas as one of the one of the three gunmen on, um, on Dilly Plaza. So do you think, like... I mean, you're saying they, they interview him as a gunman. Like, do you think the FBI has anything to do with any of these pe people like Shaver, like making them, is the FBI doing to this, that, to this, to them? Are they have real experiences? Are they schizophrenic? Like, is there something more to them? These people just cl making claims? Is there something more devious? Because things sound a little odd. And some, of it, some of it certainly can feed into those type of ideas. Richard Shaver almost certainly had some mental health issues. In the eight years he claimed to be in the caverns with the Darrow and the Taro, it turned out he was actually in a mental institution. Mm -hmm. And Ray Palmer spoke about that publicly later in the 70s. And Shaver in response said, I think most people in mental institutions hearing voices are victims of the rays from the Darrow in the caverns. So it's this very strange, it's a, it's a difficult, I mean, it's difficult to dismiss those type of elements we've just talked about, you know, aircraft crashing with Maury, with, 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 you know, Maury Island wreckage and Chrisman mm -hmm. being involved in all of this weirdness. But at the same time, there does seem to be that it, there does seem to be, it, we're, we're clearly, we're, we're fairly certain that, you know, that Shaver was mentally unwell. The question just be right. becomes how much did he actually well, see, you know? The thing is, is there are FBI agents and there are people who will drive someone crazy if they feel like they are either too, too close to over the mark or I'm not going to mention his name. He's actually a friend on my Facebook, but there, there's cases where this has happened where FBI has, made people think they were hearing some kind of voice and it was them fucking with them and making them think something was happening that wasn't. I'm aware of that. And I saw Emily Men's house a minute ago mention that kind of voice of God technology where they yeah. can beam it into people's heads. It's mm -hmm. interesting. Did they have that technology in the, you know, the thirties into the forties? I don't know. I, yeah. It, 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 whenever I hear somebody now talking about being the victim of that type of technology, I obviously can't help but think about Shaver and how Shaver would probably believe them. But at the same time, is it just such a well-known aspect of schizophrenia that you hear voices? Because mm -hmm. the the idea of um, uh, 
the idea of an influencing machine, the idea of rays pointing at you and affecting your behavior and torturing you is well known in the psychological, the psychiatric literature going yeah. back into the 19th century. There's a famous case um, in, in, in Bedlam, you know, the, the hospital for the criminally in, insane or the seriously mentally unwell in England back mm -hmm. in the 19th century. And it's called the heirloom gang story. There was a patient who believed much like Shaver that there was this secretive conspiratorial force blasting him with rays to confuse his mind and to make him do all kinds of crazy things and to drive him crazy using a device he called an heirloom. And it, he had a very elaborate mythology, just like Shaver did. And he, he claimed that, yeah, these people have been hitting him with rays forever. And it sounds very well, much like Shaver's story. So perhaps this is I a think, ongoing psychiatric you know, thing. The thing that's really interesting is, and there could be multiple interpretations of this, but schizophrenia really wasn't present before the Industrial Revolution and before they started bringing people into cities and hoarding them together in chemical wasteland shithole neighborhoods there was no such thing as schizophrenia it just didn't ever get recorded or really happen and then you start shifting society around and you start getting these reports and all these recordings of madness and i, I don't know it, it seems like every time you shift things around and involve different technologies and radio waves and electricity and all this stuff People start hearing voices, things start changing, you get a rise of some new mental illness. When things started shifting from the 50s to the 80s, you get an abundance of serial killers. It just seems really interesting. I don't think it just comes out of nowhere. I think something in our society and with technology is definitely creating it, whether it's intentional or a side effect. Well, you're going to love this part of the story of the Shaver mystery then, because you know where Richard Shaver first heard the voices. He was working in a Ford plant in Michigan. And when, he, told you. when he keyed up his <laughs> welder, when he keyed up his welder, he started to be able to hear, he said, the yeah. thoughts of his fellow workers. And then he picked up on another transmission. He picked up on a transmission coming from beneath the earth where these Dero were torturing this victim, terribly torturing them because that's supposed to be what they did. And then he also heard them talking about doing all the terrible things they do to the surface. But it was when he was literally working in that capacity. And after that, he ha later in life, he always hated cities. He hated the idea of having to work anywhere like that again. Yeah. It made him very uncomfortable. I, I, I don't think... Um... I, I think it is caused by cities, technology, and such like that. Um, I think that's the foundation. Someone wants to know about the links to MK Ultra, and I think that's fascinating because it kind of ties into really what we're talking about in a way with the government and military. I, I don't know when when they started doing MK Ultra. I'm not sure if it was that early though. Yeah, I just saw it was, it was my friend Wayne Klingman. I know he's interested in this. I do know that some of the hospitals that Sh that Shave were, was in, and he was in a couple, were later supposedly connected with these type of programs. The question, of course, is were these type of programs going on in the 30s into the early 40s? Traditionally, you're right. MK Ultra is something which we think about happening much later in history and i'm unaware and this is a, a job for probably another researcher to see what type of either mind control is a very loaded term what type of performance or what type of behavioral you know technologies or things were being tested on people in mental institutions because certainly shaver said when he was in prison and at other times that the dero and the ter or the terror would come to him and free him from where he was and all this time mm -hmm. he was in a coma he'd actually been taken somehow to the caves it's all very very strange so is it possible i mean the skeptic in me thinks that that Shaver was just somebody who probably had an incredible imagination and the trauma that he'd suffered psychologically, because he'd gone through all kinds of crazy stuff as well. Like he'd, when he was institutionalized initially, his wife, who, a couple of years, he'd been married a couple, three times, I think, in his life, but his second wife had died in an accident in a bathtub. She'd accidentally electrocuted herself. And then his daughter was taken by 
that his wife's um, parents, because they didn't want them to do have anything to do, obviously, with their father, was who was in a mental institution. He lost his brother, who he was very close with. So there's all this type of psychic trauma that Richard mm. Shaver had gone through. So one can imagine that somebody who might have been prone to this anyway got driven deeper and deeper. And then the, the type of the therapies that were available at the time, certainly there were things like hydrotherapy, which probably didn't drive you mad, but later Shaver was almost certainly um, underwent electroshock therapy. And how much of the talk about the rays and, you know, the sadism of the Darrow has to do with poor Shaver being subjected to brutal torments when he was in mm -hmm. you know mental institutions in the in the 30s and 40s where you one can only imagine what it was like to be in a mental institution then so i don't know but yeah. i mean i, I certainly know. don't out I, I wouldn't rule out the fact that somebody was you know maybe fooling around with some experimental technology but you know i have no way of proving that maybe another researcher well, could chase they were dog. certainly they were certainly torturing them that's for sure now i promised my husband i would ask you about the rock books or the rock fogo art Oh, fantastic. Um, and because yeah. I've seen them and that yeah. looks, it, re, it reminded me of a dream I had when I was a kid about, it, I'm not going to tell you, but it was more like a nightmare about something hiding in the rocks when I seen oh, this rock wow. art. So I was like, okay, we're definitely going to go into that and you can tell people what it is and mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll go and look for an image of it while you're talking about it. Yeah, there's plenty. You should pull one up. This, this is... Uh, near and dear to my heart, the Rock Fogo, the Rock Books, because it happened, it started just down the road, really, from where I live now in central Wisconsin. The whole reason I decided to do this documentary is I was researching Palmer and Shaver again. I'd already written about them in my PhD dissertation, which I submitted in 2006, and I'd already agreed with John Keel and Donald Menzel and other people that Palmer was essentially the man who invented the flying source mythology. And when I was doing research or bringing myself kind of up to speed to do a show, a mysterious library, which I used to do with Jason McLean on the Untold Radio Network, where I just do now do Talking Weird, I found that he was from Amherst, Wisconsin. And I probably knew that when I lived in Sydney, but I hadn't paid a whole lot of attention to where in Wisconsin. Why would I? I had nothing to do with Wisconsin. So when I Googled Amherst, Wisconsin, I found out this is like you know, a 40, 50 minute drive from where I live in the middle of nowhere. And I thought I couldn't make a documentary about Raymond Palmer and Richard Shaver. At the time, I actually didn't know Shaver lived there. They both lived there. And that alone, I think, is some of the stuff I've uncovered in the documentary. People knew that they lived there together, but I think, or live nearby, but it was always kind of almost framed as coincidental, like uh, Raymond Palmer or Richard Shaver had bought there first and Raymond Palmer and his family visited Richard Shaver a few times because they were friends and Ray Palmer loved it so much he bought nearby. But I don't think anybody who'd done any of the biographical work, and there's been great biographical work done on Palmer by both, um, by, by both Richard Toronto and by Natus. But I went and pulled the deeds and then I pulled the maps and everything else in Portage County. And they bought within a month of each other. And as my friend Jason McQueen, who works actually in real estate quietly, said in that period in 1949, if those deals closed within a month of each other, they were simultaneous, essentially. So what that means is Richard Shaver and Ray Palmer were such great friends. They were so close that they hunted neighboring properties because they were neighboring properties in Amherst, Wisconsin, Lanark, Wisconsin, on the outskirts of Amherst, but everybody says Amherst, but it's actually, it's still, it's called Amherst today. It used to be, I think, referred to as Lanark. They bought neighboring properties. Anyway, I spoke to another old timer of Amherst, and he said the reason Shaver got that land so cheap is it was rocky and terrible land. There were rocks everywhere. It was too expensive to farm there. It was a it was that part of, of of Amherst which was just yeah very very rocky and it is it's all hilly. Was, central Wisconsin is fairly flat, but where the Palmer and Shaver properties are, where I've been a number of times now, kind of it winds up onto a, a hill and there's rocks everywhere. And anyway, Richard Shaver, after having moved there with Raymond Palmer, and, and apparently in what I can only imagine was a very coordinated move to move your families from Chicago to the middle of nowhere, rural Wisconsin in 1949. Anyway, his wife, Dorothy, Shaver's wife, Dorothy, dropped some rocks on Shaver's desk and said, there's weird images and pictures of people in these, like faces in these rocks. And Shaver apparently didn't pay any attention. But then 
he looked at them more seriously a week or two later and he could see faces in these rocks. And so that is where the second part of the Shaver mystery starts. The first part started in Amazing Stories until they could no run, longer run the stories in the late 40s. The second part starts in the late 50s, early 60s, when Richard Shaver, living in Amherst, Lanark, discovers these rocks with what look like faces in them. And he believed that these rocks were rock books left from a previous civilization, the same type of civilizations he'd been talking about in the original Shaver mystery. And here was his proof. And he began what became the passion for the rest of his life until he died in the mid-1970s. He would do things like split these rocks in parts with, with, with precision saws because he believed he didn't have the technology. He, he thought if you had the technology, you could read these rocks the way we read a book. And they'd been left here by these ancient races. But if you cut them, he could see elements of the story. And they they weren't perfect, though. Like, they'd sometimes have multiple images printed on them of all these different figures and all these um, different weird creatures. And he had a, he developed a, an artistic technique where he would project these images onto, like, a cardboard, and he would sprinkle glue, and he would... He would do all these weird things to bring out the images more. And when I spoke to people in the area, I spoke to the people who now own Richard Shaver's old property. And they remember when they demolished this old farmhouse, which isn't there anymore, all these rock books. And I knew they'd seen them because the guy told me, he said, how did he cut them so thin? And it, they, he said, it looked like they had a lacquer on them, which is what they did. I spoke to another old timer who, and I'd never heard this story before. Two people have told me this now, that Richard Shaver used to display his rock books at the Portage County Fair, which is in Amherst. And mm -hmm. it's still a conservative area today. But imagine in not late 50s, early 60s Amherst, these erotic, weird pictures with demons and goblins and nude women on them. And one of the men told me he remembered his mother dragging him away from Richard Shaver's rock book stand. Oh, that would have been very scandalous. Yeah, like sh like these pictures that you you're showing now. There, I mean, it's it's by the way, Richard Shaver's now recognised as this wonderful outsider artist, and they've had, you know, showings in L.A. and New York, posthumously, of course, because again, he died in the 1970s, and his artwork is very hard to come by. I know some. I know Doug Skinner who is John Keel's literary heir, mm -hmm. incidentally, who's been helpful with some advice while I've been making this. He he has a little bit of the art, but my understanding is most of it was bought up by a collector who thought they were going to make a, a lot of money out of Richard Shaver and owning all the, the property. And it's very hard. Like, if you try to buy a Richard Shaver piece today, forget about it. What you should do, if you're interested, is Richard Toronto, who wrote War Over Lemuria, which is just a fantastic biography about Shaver and Palmer. He has two volume books on Rock Fogo and they're lovely, like, mm -hmm. you no know, kind of coffee yeah. table books. And the artwork in them is phenomenal. Like it's unlike any book you've ever gotten. So if you're interested in this, go and get Richard Toronto's uh, Rock Fogo books. They're, they're just amazing. Well, I love them. And I know some people might say it's pareidolia, but any person, any artist, a sculpture, he sees the form in the piece of rock before he even begins. So I, I would say it's something similar, not just, yes, he's seeing the form, but he's shaping it. And that's what you do as a sculptor yeah. or any artist. Absolutely. You see the form before, before it takes place. That's how it comes to life. Absolutely. And regardless of the reality of them being rock books or not from some pre-diluvial civilization. The artwork's just spectacular. Like I, when I first, because I didn't know, I mean, when I'd written about them for the PhD dissertation, Natus hadn't written his biography, Toronto hadn't written his biographies. So I was just going off, you know, material from the time. As soon as I found out, I started to Google, I want some shaver art to hang on my wall, like original shaver art. There's got to right. be some. No, try to find some shaver art. Good luck. Right. No doubt. Someone wants to know, uh, Horace would like to know, if you have had tried any splitting any rocks to see what you could find. You know, I have <laughs> I have one rock from Richard Shaver's property. When I f finally found somebody there, because it's still a kind of farmy property, and spoke to one of the owners, I was like, can I take a rock? 
And he was like, sure. So I took up a rock and soak it. <laughs> and I was meant to be able to feel. Here's, here's, a, here's a wonderful, very strange irony. Shaver was this ultimate kind of atheist. Like he thought all of this was physical. None of it was spiritual. Where Shaver's house once was, this owner's family tore it down. They have their own house there now. And they built, which is quite common in this part of the Midwest, this massive Catholic shrine on the top of Richard, where Richard House, where Richard Shaver's farmhouse once stood in Lanark. And they were going to let me film there. I was so excited because to film on Shaver's property, I mean, good gosh. And I, I, I visit, I finally got, I finally found somebody home and I called them a week later. After they said I could shoot there, I called them a week later uh, to, to arrange a time to go and shoot some stuff. And then he said, no, we've decided, meaning I assume him and his wife, uh, this is like satanic and, um, we're Christians and we can't be on board. And I started to say, well, I'm a Christian it's not, and hang up. So I know they're not going to let me shoot there. Like, no, you can't. Oh, dear. Basically it. Yeah. It's very sad because of course you can make a documentary about all kinds of things you don't agree with. You don't have yeah. to think Richard Shaver's vision Look, of reality was correct. To I've, make a documentary I've about interviewed it. people on Alistair Crowley and I don't like the limits. I don't like that crap. I think, he, you know, I have some, you know, it's not my thing and it's their thing. And, uh, you know, we, it's, you know, you, you, yeah, just because you're looking at it doesn't mean you're not Christian. No. It's, it's interesting. I wanted to ask you about, so a lot of this stuff about people under the ground influencing your thoughts and doing stuff, it kind of reminds me of a lot of stuff you find in conspiracy theories today, like hollow earth, reptilians, all that stuff. Do you think that is like a legacy? Like it just keeps developing? Absolutely. I think we, I think you can't talk about modern hollow earth belief without talking about Richard Palmer. Well, sorry, Richard Shaver and Ray Palmer. And Ray Palmer certainly ran hollow earth stuff in his magazines as well. Shaver was one of the first people talking about the entrance to the hollow earth being at the North Pole, by the way. Shaver was at some stage trying to suggest we need to do a military ex, you know, expedition into the into the Darrow world via the holes at the pole and go and take you know their or the caves because they didn't really shave it and think of it as the hollow earth as you know the popular thing is now where there is people inside there A but space. there were there were entrances to the hollow earth you know and he wanted he was saying we need to go and take all this technology those people have down there palmer also popular popularized the broader hollow earth type theory in a number of his magazines after the shaver mystery and it's funny just just as a very quick aside you'll probably find this interesting still today on facebook i regularly see posts about devil's tower in wyoming being an old tree trunk a giant tree trunk from you know have you ever heard that have you ever seen those posts melissa i'm sure some people have here you know, you know, yeah, Devil's I don't Tower. recall. Yeah, the, the, I don't recall it, but I, I might have. But I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, my my memory is like getting funky it, these days. There's so many weird <laughs> things out there. I don't blame you. But a popular thing that still pops up on in Facebook posts is pictures of Devil's Tower in Wyoming that most people recognize as the kind of mini mountain thing in Close Encounters of the Third Kind at the end. And people say, "Look, it looks like an ancient tree trunk." It's quite popular and weird conspiracy theory still. Of course, who introduced that idea? Raymond Palmer and Richard Shaver in the Shaver Only issue of um, Amazing Stories stories from 1947 so all these i all these weird ideas still circulating you can often go back and find them originating or being popularized by by ray palmer interesting now what about i wanted to, to think about this idea of time travel did they ever talk about like some kind of vibrational thing that these things were time travelers or was it just straight up they were in earth or were they like aliens from you know in another dimension vibrating anywhere you hear that stuff as well like they, you'll hear david ike talk about yep. that kind of stuff very very good question shaver always thought and insisted that all of this was very physical and literal, that the Darrow and the okay. Tarot lived under the earth, that they were the leftovers from an ancient race that fled to the stars, but also that there were extraterrestrials coming to earth, still battling the people under the surface to take the resources. It was, but it was all very physical while Ray Palmer, as sympathetic he, as he was to the Shaver mystery, became very interested in this 19th century channeled New Age Bible called Awaspi. He actually reprinted Awaspi. He, he was so, it, 
influential in the popularization of a waspy that the most recent edition is dedicated to Ray Palmer and his green edition, as it's called, with the cover. He published out of Amherst, again, just down the road. And a waspy tells a story about all these levels of spiritual good and evil and their influence on man and their battles and what palmer began to believe or at least express in letters to shaver and as well as in his publications is that while the shaver mystery might not be as literal as we think it is shaver had those experiences they were just spiritual experiences with the type of beings that were popularized in a waspy now again shaver disagreed with this so very much and so when mm. palmer comes out and says shaver was in a mental institution while all of while he was having all these experiences the casual observer thinks well palmer's saying that they're not true then but remember what we talked about with how he's common at the beginning Palmer was always very adept at taking two contradictory facts and still being able to find a truth out of them. So his version was when Shaver was in the mental institution comatosed, he was actually traveling at an astral or a different vibrational level and visiting the caverns in that capacity, dealing with the type of beings that he'd read about in the in the channeled bible that he was becoming more and more fascinated with a waspy so it's a good question it's certainly there's certainly a conflict in the way palmer and shaver both imagined what these beings were because i i would find it more interesting if there was some vibrational thing especially if you're the one who sees it and nobody else does it would Very good be point. more explainable to me and me and my husband have talked about like how we can manifest things and it's vibrational. It would be more explainable to me that if you're the only one who who, sows, who sees it and, and nobody else does that, you might be tapping into some different thing or you could be crazy, but, you know, <laughs> explore either one. Well, Palmer would have agreed with you. Shaver wouldn't have. Shaver would say, it's as real as this table. Like he was very physical, but Palmer would have gone, yeah, that's exactly what happened to him. When he was in the caves, he would travel there astrally. He was going on yeah. a different vibration. It was a spiritual, not a physical experience. Well, there you go. Well, and I mean, who knows? Maybe there was something was physical, but like we say, I, I was, you know, in my, when I took history, I, I noted very distinctly that schizophrenia shows up at a certain point in history and it's right along with um, the industrial revolution. So food for thought. Now I wanted to get into asking you about this. There was, I was reading about the science fiction devotees at the time didn't like where this sort of amazing stories was going. And they were a very small part of the readership. Remember, according to, to Palmer, it got as high as a quarter of a million. Certainly, it probably got to 185,000, which was phenomenal for a pulp at the time. The science fiction fandom at the time was anywhere from a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand people. So it was a very small minority of the readers of Amazing Stories. Mm -hmm. It'd be like today if people of a certain political persuasion started writing the Marvel Studios and wanting to get, you know, um, an actor cancelled mm -hmm. because they were conservative, oh. forgetting or that they, most of the audience they, might be conservative. Or they wanted somebody off the ballot. <laughs> yeah, right. I won't go down that political thing. I'm you not get, going you get political. The idea. I just had to throw no, that in there. I get it, and I agree. And so this is also a fascinating part about this story. Potentially... Raymond Palmer and Richard Shaver were the first people of popular culture to ever be cancelled. And Ray Palmer was already unpopular with science fiction fandom before the Shaver mystery. The Shaver mystery was just the nail in his coffin because during World War II, he was very much, you know, mom and apple pie and, you know, pro pro America and very super conservative with everything he did. So, and all of his stories too were juveniles unfair, but they were the type of stories, which is how he repopularized amazing stories, which appealed to teen readers, you know, kind of like Captain Kirk beating some, you know, monster with his, sh his shirt torn and then making up, making out with, you know, a gorgeous Venusian or something or whatever, right? It was very much that kind of, you know, romance and violence and that type of science fiction, Buck Rogers' science fiction. While 
there was a type of science fiction fan, the hardcore fans who wanted the more cerebral science fiction, things based on the technology to shortly come. So Palmer's editorial style, and he would tell readers if the he would tell writers if the story was getting boring, throw another body through the skylight. In other words, like make the story more exciting. He wanted that exciting, you know, stuff we think of as pulp today, you know. So he was already hated by an element of science fiction fandom, which was kind of the New York type, you know, the people who were into the, the other magazine, Astounding, which was more cerebral. So he was already hated by that clique. When he ran the Shaver mystery, saying, this is real, this man's encountered, you know, Deros and Teros beneath the surface of the earth, they lost their minds. But so they tried to get him cancelled. I think I, I, I've certainly, since I've been doing um, doing the documentary and spoken to people who are fairly well versed in it, people say, well, it wasn't so much, it wasn't so much the effort of the fans, perhaps as it was major magazines of the time ridiculing, general circulation magazines, mm -hmm. ridiculing the the Shaver mystery that made Ziff Davis, the publishers, who were also mentioned by name in some of these articles, go, no, we're killing the Shaver mystery. This is crazy. Right. But there was a there was a aggressive attempt by fandom, not by the hundred plus thousand readers who were just normal people, the tiny clique of, you know, the loud radicals to cancel Ray Palmer and Richard Shaver. Well, Very aggressive. Isn't that isn't that typical of those kind of elite people that it's the same they way. think they try to force people they're literally trying to force people to engage with their content instead of saying, huh, what are these people up to? Maybe mm -hmm. we can get creative. Um, and they, they also don't really understand market because obviously Shavers and Palmer's market were, um, or whatever, was much more vast than this elite market. <laughs> so you're going to get more readership and you can only charge so much for a flipping magazine. I mean, come on. And you see the magazine prices today. I'm like, woo. <laughs> so it's, it's, I always think that now when I was a kid, I used to buy all these comic books. I look at comic books today and they're like, I'm like, how could you, how could a child even afford to buy like, you know, 10 know. comic books a month? What on earth? Yeah. Um. So la one of our last questions, we're going to head it out. Emily wants to know, we're going to ask about your documentary and when it's going to be released. Cause Dean has done a documentary on the Shaver mystery. So we can go with that to tie up the show. Good one, sure. Emily. Well, thank you, Emily. I'm still I'm still working on. I'd say it's over half shot now. There's still a lot to shoot. I hope to get more shot out this summer, but I have to do it in a part time capacity. I have my daughter almost full time. I have other responsibilities, so there's still a bit to mm -hmm. shoot. I I would have I would have liked to have said latter later this year, but to be honest, it mightn't be until um, 2025 now. But it's coming along really nicely. I'm so happy with what I have. I've got a lot more still to shoot. I really want to do. I think they are so important. I think Palmer and Shaver. I, I'm amazed nobody's made a documentary about them they're so influential on both science fiction on ufo belief on all kinds of occult mm -hmm. ideology that i want to do the very best job i can i'll certainly keep people posted if you go to the shaver at the moment that just literally points to the facebook page the man who invented flying saucers but i try to keep little updates going there i, I did get which was fun the other day i got to shoot um a, a, a cafe called Fleming's, which doesn't sound that exciting on the surface, just closed in Amherst. But Fleming's was the cafe that Ray Palmer would go to every morning when he lived in Amherst before he would, because he had to go to the post office because his business was all publishing books and magazines. He'd go to the post office every day and he would stop in Fleming's and he would hold court with people who wanted to hear about the, the old Shaver mystery and UFOs and things. And it's still owned by the original, um, the, the grandchildren of Catherine Fleming, who was the person who owned Fleming. So to go to that cafe and to sit where Palmer used to sit and to shoot, I got to shoot people there. And I talked to people there who, who knew Shaver, who, who rather knew mm -hmm. Palmer and still remembered Palmer. Um, but they closed on December 31st, but I'm so glad I, mm -hmm. I got to shoot some stuff there the other day. It was, um, it was fantastic. So gradually I'm, it's also a little bit like chasing the reaper, making a documentary about people who died in the mid, to late 1970s and who were at their height in the you know the late 1940s early 50s because so many people who knew them are just you know uh, aren't here with us so we're gradually losing them so i'm trying to i'm trying to chase that as fast and as hard you're, as i can you're being an archivist of your own 
I hope so. I hope to. I hope to. Yeah. I hope to let people know how important this is because in this day where all we do is talk about UAPs and Tic Tac video, you know the Tic Tac videos and congressional, you know, investigations and whistleblowers, people seem to forget widely that a lot of this, these beliefs and a lot of these ideas started long before even Kenneth Arnold saw those initial nine sources at Mount Rainier. Wow. And it all started with science fiction. Kind of, it, I mean, it also reminds me of something like Star Trek. Like all this stuff is all tied in. It influences technology. Oh, it's, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. and, and I love the original Star Trek just because it's not sciencey actually, because it's kind of campy. I just love that. That's Ray Palmer's imprint. <laughs> That's amazing yeah, story. 100%. 100%. All right, Dean, is there anything you want to tie up or mention about the Shaver Mysteries before we sign off? No, except that I think people who are interested in in UFO belief and interested in alternative histories and strange ideas should really seek out, uh, seek out some Shaver Mystery material. There's a lot of it online. There's a lot, even on archive.org, I think there's a lot of old amazing stories. But I would recommend getting Richard Toronto's War Over Lemuria book about Shaver and Palmer. It's such a spectacular book. And get those Rock Fogo books by Richard Toronto as well. Because mm -hmm. you'll you'll be just staggered when you read the story. It's more it's That's more right. amazing than any story probably might, ever in science fiction. I might check those book out books out. I've seen them there and they look I mean it looks like fascinating fascinating art. I, I mean but I mean in order to have an original you'd have to have a rock. <laughs> In your house. You know, it's like, here's my rock. <laughs> That's heavy. No one's breaking into your house and stealing that work of art. I That's trust true. You. <laughs> All right, Dean. Well, hang tight in the green room and I'll sign off here. And thank you very much for coming on the show. It's such a joy to talk to you always, Melissa. All right. Thank you. All right, everybody. I want to thank you guys for coming in. We had a great audience tonight. We had a whole bunch of people in and lots of comments all on all of the platforms. Again, please subscribe, like the content, share the content. And of course, the audio podcast will be up soon. You can go over the audio, audio podcast. Most importantly, iTunes and five star the show. Give us some good comments and help it rate. I'm so glad you guys all came in. We've got a couple of good shows coming up all the way through January. Next week, uh, Tuesday the 9th, Bob Antone. He's talking about ghosts and his historical tours. I've got Gary Parsons coming on the 16th of January, uh, 3 p.m. We're doing it a little early because Gary is from the UK. He's going to be talking about Hammer Horror. His father worked for Hammer Horror. So Gary knew all the greats, Christopher Lee, everything. So we're going to be talking about that. Tuesday at 3 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, I've got Jen Dorrell coming back sometime. I haven't situated it yet. 23rd, 24th, we're going to be talking ghosts and EVP. And the 31st of January, Tobe Johnson is in the house talking all about the paranormal Bigfoot. And he has a wonderful documentary about Sasquatch Bigfoot as well. So thank you guys so much. I'm going to head on out. You guys have a wonderful evening on the Ghostly Archives. Thank you so much.